Ta-da! Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the great introduction. I appreciate that. And let's get right to it. So is this really separation anxiety? And if so, are they doing the right thing about it? It's from a TV commercial seen in the Super Bowl. There's a train and it Life is brief, but it's a couple of problems with that TV commercial, right? I'll talk about what some of them are. For example, uh, getting another dog doesn't necessarily solve the problem of separation anxiety. I'll talk about that in more detail. Dogs with separation anxiety rarely take pictures off the wall. Well, people are home. It is, after all, separation anxiety. But exactly what is separation anxiety? And I'll talk about that. I'll talk about right now why we might be seeing it more often as a result of the pandemic. So dogs that recently, or I'm sorry, previously had separation anxiety, even those treated successfully, because some of you anyway, stayed home during the pandemic, and now suddenly you're gone, or maybe did a wonderful thing and adopted or fostered a dog, Maybe it was a foster failure. Now that dog is there all the time. You were there all the time. The dog never had the opportunity to be home alone. And then, poof, the dog is suddenly home alone. That's difficult for many dogs to handle. Uh, shelter and rescue dogs, those previously rehomed several times, are more predisposed. Having said that, there is no indication, no indication that shelter dogs, just because they are dogs in animal shelters are more likely to have separation anxiety. And anytime there's a change that can be upsetting to us, right? So some of us handled the pandemic, I don't care, whatever, 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 I'm now staying home, I'm now doing it this way, I'm not doing it that way, and we're fine. Other people got really, really stressed out. In fact, we saw a suicide spike during the pandemic. So is it truly separation anxiety in the first place, which by the way, is a panic attack. So at its full blown real separation anxiety, and can there be levels of separation anxiety? I'll talk about that part because no one really knows, even though some people say they know, but I'll explain all that. But separation anxiety is truly a panic attack. Uh, but is it separation anxiety? So for those of you who feel your dog has separation anxiety, you might be, and probably you're right, but maybe not. The dog could just be bored being home alone and was never perhaps taught to be home alone in the first place. Is the dog under-exercised? Now, exercise is a great thing. As Dr. Ian Dunbar once famously said, uh, a good dog is a tired dog. True enough, but a dog that truly has separation anxiety, you take that dog for a 10 mile run and I'm not endorsing any dog go for a 10 mile run necessarily. However, take that dog for a 10 mile run. Now you've got a tired dog with separation anxiety. So exercise is a part of the solution, but it is not the entire solution or anywhere near that. Is it a dog who is simply, as I said earlier, never taught to be home alone? could be a house training issue, potentially. It could be a very old dog who has cognitive dysfunction. And the dog is having accidents, not necessarily because the dog 
doesn't want to be home alone, but the dog has simply forgotten house training. Canine cognitive dysfunction syndrome is kind of like Alzheimer's in dogs. And sometimes neighbors report, the dog is barking, you're not there. Well, is the dog just having a good time barking at the window? As many dogs do have a good time. And now we have more people coming to our homes than ever before. So it's not only the U USPS, United States Postal Service, USPS person, it is also uh, UPS, it's also FedEx, it's also a delivery service of another kind, and it's all these other people coming now. The dog has even more potentially to bark at, never mind just people walking up and down the street if the dog has a view. That's not necessarily separation anxiety. A dog is tearing up the pillows. The dog might be having a great time doing it. It's not necessarily separation anxiety. So as I said, separation anxiety, which is actually isolation distress, and dogs are pack animals. So it's not natural for dogs to be ever alone if you go back generations in their history. They never did that, right? Because they lived together in a group. Uh, dogs don't leave other dogs alone and say, I'm going off to work. Uh, and it is very, very often a panic attack. So what are the signs of real separation anxiety? This isn't all of them, it's most of them. And I like using the slide because it's really colorful. And it does describe what some of actually most of the signs are for separation anxiety. Now, how many of these do you need, the magic question, for it to be identified as separation anxiety? No one knows the answer to that necessarily, or does it have to be extreme? So if the dog just nibbles a little bit, I'm looking at the one, the destruction, if the dog nibbles just a little bit at that table, as opposed to eating up half the table, or table leg in this case. So is there one that is, okay, that dog may not have separation anxiety because the dog is just nibbling a little bit on the table leg? Or is the dog truly have separation anxiety because the dog's eating half the table leg? The truth is that we can be, and let me try to explain this the best I can. We can be exceedingly anxious and not demonstrate. So let me try it this way. Take two people, one person, another person. This person is really, 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 really anxious, but only eats a part of the, I don't know a lot of people that eat table legs, but only eats a little bit of the table leg. This person, not quite as anxious, but for whatever reason, eats more of the table leg. We all describe our anxieties differently and express them differently. And it's no different with our dogs. So for those who say, this dog has an extreme level of separation anxiety. Yes, if the dog is jumping out the window there, a better way to say it are extreme signs of separation anxiety, as opposed to the dog that may occasionally urinate at the door, but isn't jumping out the window. Does that make any sense to you? I, I hope so. Both dogs have separation anxiety is the bottom line. And to some extent, I don't know that we need to, because we don't understand yet, in my opinion, we, we don't need to describe it as extreme or not extreme, unless it's so incredibly mild that you could just simply distract the dog, and I'll talk about ways to do that. So here's an example of absolute separation anxiety. Dog is crated, so there are some who say dogs and crates they're not gonna be having separation anxiety or it's a way to fix the problem. It can actually make matters worse depending on the dog. I'm gonna forward a little because this video goes on quite a while. So the dog is whining, barking, wagging tail. Doesn't mean the dog is happy, wants to get out. I'm forwarding a little bit tearing up the crate. Now, this could be a problem because the dog could break teeth doing this. The dog could uh, cut himself or herself. You see the uh, fur flying. So when dogs are nervous, that literally does happen. Also, we see hypersalivation here. 
and the dog will eventually break out, is slipping on the floor in part because it's wet from uh, the dog's extreme salivation. Oh man, that shouldn't have happened. Forgive me. Oh, play from, oh jeez. Okay, there we go. <laughs> is there a breed predisposition? I get asked this question all the time. Uh, this is one study, the results say yes. Other studies say yes, but have completely different breeds or some different breeds listed. Uh, is there an individual genetic component? We don't know. So if my mother had separation anxiety, uh, am I more likely to have it? We just don't know the answers to that. We do know that 57% uh, of dogs are between the age of about one and five. We do know that nearly all dogs with separation anxiety, and I'll talk about this more, have signs of other anxieties as well. 20 to 40% of all behavior problems. This was pre-pandemic. So this number is likely higher now. Uh, more adoptions. So does that mean more separation anxiety? Well, we've seen that, but are they correlated with one another? We don't know that. We do know that dogs that have been in multiple homes are more likely to have separation distress. Uh, neutering is, is a qualifier, but then again, all dogs, or well, let me rephrase that. Many dogs, most dogs are neutered these days, which is a good thing. So therefore, of course, uh, the dogs with separation anxiety are more likely to be spayed neutered because the, all dogs are more likely to be spayed neutered. Uh, dogs with one anxiety issue, as I said, are more likely to have another. And this is just one chart. Uh, this is data from a CC Animal Health. However, there's other data and it's all a little different. So the other loud noises at the left is 40% here on this chart. It might be 42% or 38% on another chart. Uh, with another study, but they're all more or less in the same range, really, really close to one another. It does seem that dogs that have separation anxiety have at least one and often other anxieties, plural. So separation anxiety is important because we're talking about the quality of life, not only for the dog, but for all of you as well, right? If you live with a dog with separation anxiety, you probably feel guilty about going anywhere in the first place unless you've done something about it for that dog. And even then you're watching the cameras maybe of your dog instead of watching the movie that you've just gone to. Um, and then there's a concern about relinquishment, uh, particularly for people that live in uh, apartments or condominiums. That's a real concern, right? That that dog, because the landlord is complaining because other owners or renters are complaining may need to be given up. It can also uh, impact the human-animal bond. So I've got it, what you've been waiting for, and the talk can end right here. Here is the cure for separation anxiety that you've not seen before. Okay, that doesn't always work. So here are some myths about what never to do, and then I promise I will talk about what to do. Uh, pet parents saying, I caused it because I sleep with my dog and I love my dog. I kiss her a lot. No, 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 no. Go ahead and sleep with your dog. Go ahead and kiss your dog. It's not going to make your dog have separation anxiety. If your dog does have separation anxiety, it's not going to make it worse. Some people think it's not treatable. I would not be giving this talk if that were the case. Uh, medications are only the last resort. No, they are not. Please believe me, and I will explain why, like one or two slides away, medications need to be considered for dogs that have true separation anxiety. Uh, the dog is just being spiteful, doing it on purpose because my schedule changed, or because I hollered at the dog yesterday, or whatever. No, dogs never do this, ever, on purpose. Uh, only rescued dogs have this problem. I talked about that, but I want to reiterate, not true. Uh, the dog isn't well-trained enough. Well, this has nothing to do with the intelligence of your dog. Your dog can be a Mensa dog, can know the names of 78 toys, or even, what was it, over a thousand toys that a dog named Chaser knew the name of. I mean, incredible. And I the owner has since passed away, uh, but the uh, Pili Bianchi is the uh, 
daughter of the owner, uh, Dr. Bianchi. And uh, she wrote a book that's really interesting. It's out now. And she says she would have to write down the names or didn't know the names of all the toys, but her dog, Chaser, knew the names. Could Chaser have had separation anxiety? To my knowledge, Chaser did not have separation, but would that be possible? Absolutely. Uh, it's got nothing to do with intelligence. Uh, you can't sue the dog with separation anxiety. It will reinforce the anxiety. Well, that doesn't make sense because separation anxiety is about separation. But it can make sense because let's say, and there are not a lot of instances of this, but this does happen. So I described earlier how uh, our dog is more uh, sensitive about being separated from my wife than me. If what I had described earlier, just throwing some kibble in the dog's direction or waiting five minutes might've worked as well for the dog to realize that mom is not there anymore. But if the dog truly were to have a panic attack, me telling the dog everything okay is okay is not going to probably solve the problem, but it's not going to make matters worse. Uh, dogs with separation anxiety must be created. We saw earlier that's not the case. It, often it can help, but sometimes it makes matters worse and sometimes doesn't do anything. So what doesn't work aside from creating, getting another dog or another pet. The separation is generally from a human being. Now, there are exceptions to everything. And <clears throat> excuse me, I know instances where uh, a dog has passed away in the home and the dog that remains develops separation anxiety and getting another dog does make the difference. But that's actually the exception rather than the rule. Uh, what happens, particularly if you get a puppy and you have an adult dog with separation anxiety, here's what happens. That puppy learns to be anxious doesn't have the same thing going on as the dog with the true separation anxiety, but that puppy learns to act the way that other dog is acting. So now you've got two dogs with essentially separation anxiety. Being the pack leader, telling the dog, I am the boss, does nothing, except sometimes deteriorates, deteriorates, that's a better way to say it, the human animal bond. I talked about exercise being helpful, but it's not the cure. Some people think, okay, I just do nothing. The dog is going to realize I'm coming home. Yet, unfortunately, we, didn't, we need to do a lot more than that because they're dogs and they don't have that kind of logic. In fact, the anxiety kind of builds like a snowball over time. Punishment, I hope you all know that actually it's separation anxiety. Punishment makes our dogs anxious, so that will make matters. Will, will make matters worse and in fact, impact the human animal bond and not in a good way. So what's going on here? Back from lunch and why are you so guilty, bunny? So the dog had an accident while the people were gone. This dog has separation anxiety. What did you do? Is this dog really feeling guilty? Is this dog really feeling sorry? Oh, I was a bad dog, I did this. No. The dog, even though these people are not hollering, they're not yelling at the dog, I assume, you can't see them, but I assume their body language is not indicative of them being upset, although that's possible. There is something else this dog is picking up on. And this dog knows that these people are in some way, shape or form, not happy. So this dog is kind of like saying, I'm feeling badly, but not guilty. There's a difference. And I don't want anything to happen to me. It's almost self-protective as to what's going on here. Not that the people ever abuse this dog. So that is natural canine behavior. What is not possible in canine behavior is the dog to think, I did something wrong and I feel guilty about it. Dogs do not have that capability. Uh, tools to identify canine separation anxiety. There's no identifiable one test your veterinarian can take. But if you hear nothing else, for those non-veterinarians, I want you to hear this. You would not diagnose diabetes. How could you? In your dog or cat. You would not diagnose heart disease. How could you? Well, people make a stab at... and. 
meaning well to, to diagnose separation anxiety, feeling, okay, it's a behavior issue that's different. Well, it's not really. First of all, as I described earlier, it's possible whatever's going on may not be separation anxiety. And we now know that dogs, as one example, in pain may express anxiety when their people aren't there and somehow tolerate the pain when their people are there. I mean, you've all had circumstances like this, right? You act differently when Aunt Claire comes to visit. <laughs> you either pretend everything is okay when it's not, or depending on Aunt Claire's demeanor, maybe you unload on her. It's not too different with our dogs in some cases. The point is, have a video, have your veterinarian who's a professional or a veterinary technician perhaps that specializes in behavior, watch that video and then just like heart disease, just like diabetes, make a diagnosis. That really is what is required. And who doesn't have one of these today, a phone, you know? Uh, be proactive to help determine if your dog has separation anxiety. So leave the house if you don't know. I'm saying if you don't know. So leave the house and either leave all these treats around. I'm assuming the dog is somewhat full of food motivated. Favorite treats. And just leave for five minutes, have the camera up if that's possible. But with treats, you could tell they're either gone or they're not when you come back home. If they're gone, well, that doesn't necessarily mean the dog has no separation anxiety, but it does mean that the dog is dealing with it if the dog does, or it's likely the dog doesn't. And that whatever you think was going on may not be exactly separation anxiety. So that's one way to do it. For dogs with, and I am contradicting myself here, with low level anxiety that are just, it's not profound, you don't even know if it's true separation anxiety, but something's going on. And they're picking up on your cues. You may be able to prevent separation anxiety from further escalating, or for some dogs, something like this can work. Leave a really good treat. You get them prepared first before you go. Stick them in the fridge. Stick them inside some toys. Leave as about five minutes before you go up on top of a counter, unless you have a St. Bernard or Irish Wolfhound, but somewhere really high up where the dog can't get to it, but knows it's there, can see it, knows what it is. And what dogs do is they pick up on our cues, which I'll talk about more, and they get upset and more and more and more upset the more cues they pick up on as we're about to go. So this prevents that from happening. And instead the dog is focused on those treats and could be thinking, get the heck out already so I could have those treats. Because if you've done this a, a couple of times, the dog will know, I get that, what's up on the counter? Right as the people are leaving the house. I get that great stuff, that peanut butter stuff in a Kong toy or whatever it is. And then as you're about to leave, don't sneak out, never do that. But instead, put the toys down, tell your dog or ask your dog to sit. And then as you're literally exiting the house, say free or go or whatever your cue is. And if the dog goes to scarf up those treats, uh, that's amazing. So you've either solved the separation issue, at least for now, or prevented it from happening. And you have a camera watch everything. So why am I an advocate of pharmaceuticals? Not for all dogs, but in the right cases. We cannot learn if we are panicked. So this guy right here, you ask him, the guy with the shorts on, you ask him as you're reaching out the window to save him. By the way, can you figure out my income tax this year? I don't think he's in a place to do that. Can you solve another problem for me? Because last week, here's what happened to me. And I need you to solve this problem, this mechanical issue with my air conditioning system, because that's what this guy does. He does air conditioners. He was about to install a window unit, and instead of the window unit falling, he nearly did. I'm making that up. My point is, this guy is in no position to teach or to learn, obviously. 
Well, if your dogs are panicked, remember I said it's a panic attack, they can't learn. So the behavior modification is really important, but we have to get something on board to adjust the neurochemistry in their heads. And there's two possible heavy hitters that can both be used or one of the two can be used. And one is a pharmaceutical. Now, some drugs take a while to kick in, others kick in really fast. Your veterinarian can tell you what is best for your circumstance and for your pet. Uh, but I, I will tell you the people that push back on drugs, I push back on you because unless that dog has a medical condition where, and there are dogs for sure, 17 year old dog uh, and, and the veterinarian says, let's not do drugs, there is an alternative. Or you want an alternative to work with the drug so you can get off the drug sooner. I am not saying drugs are the best thing in the world always, but it's certainly better than being euthanized. It's certainly better than having a panic attack. And it's certainly better than being relinquished to an animal shelter because the human animal bond is fractured or because neighbors are complaining. So I'm not gonna talk about specific drugs here. I'm a certified animal behavior consultant, not a veterinarian, but I will say there are several drugs, not just one. So if that one doesn't work, another can be tried. But usually for veterinarians that know, that one is somewhat likely to work. And if you see a veterinary behaviorist, they're the ultimate experts when it comes to all this. So pharmaceuticals are one option, but that's chemical intervention. But physics, if you will, is another option. And that is what I'm about to talk about here. Targeted pulsed electromagnetic therapy, which is what this product is, the Calmer Canine. Uh, because I can talk about it and because it's, I said there were two heavy hitters, two things that you know are really going to work. There are other things that you can and perhaps should do for dogs with separation anxiety as an adjunct. But these are the two big ones, pharmaceuticals and uh, what I'm about to talk about, targeted pulsed electromagnetic therapy. So this device emits signals that actually do something similar to what those drugs do. They shrink the swelling in the dog's brain because that's actually what happens. When these dogs are panicked, and the same thing with humans become panicked, parts of the brain actually swell. And neurochemicals that we don't want to see become more active. And the neurochemicals we do want to see, uh, the positive, neurochemicals, uh, uh, serotonin and dopamine and others uh, dissipate. So what this does is it changes things back to normal for that dog. I hope that makes sense. And it's easy to do. And there are no known adverse reactions or side effects. So this is what it looks like. And you literally hold it over the dog's head. Well, you're watching TV and the dog is sitting next to you or there's a vest that comes with it. Depending on the size of the dog, you can get a different size vest and you literally put that on the dog and you don't need to hold anything. The dog kind of holds it himself or herself because it's like you see right there. Ideally two sessions a day, 15 minutes a piece. The product turns off automatically after about 15 minutes. So you don't have to worry about, oh, it's 14 minutes, I'm looking at my watch. Um, it can be handheld, as I said, or used with the vest. Uh, the treatment is simply done at home. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to do anything. There's one button that pushes it on, so you don't need to be a techie, which is something I like. How long does it take? Well, that depends on the dog and other things that are going on that we just don't understand necessarily, but about four to six weeks. But many people have seen an improvement over one treatment. And if you're using this along with pharmaceuticals, all things move along quicker. And by the way, this can be used absolutely with pharmaceuticals. So statistically, and I'll talk about some uh, scientific studies a bit, uh, but uh, most dogs showed a resolution. All dogs showed improvement, uh, at least 50% lasting effects 
and two out of three dogs. Uh, no, that's wrong. 75% of dogs, two thirds of dogs, lasting effects. So once the treatment course happens, they're fine. However, if they're not, you can do it again. There's no downside for that. So there are a variety of different studies that have been published, peer-reviewed journals, all that, all that, all that, that I'm not gonna go into, into detail here. The bottom line is that when compared to a placebo, the calmer canine really works, the placebo not so much. Dogs treated with the calmer canine showed a significant reduction with separation anxiety signs. As I said, some immediately and uh, nearly all after six weeks of treatment. So I wanna highlight that line below. Half of owners documented improvement after one week of treatment. Remember, it's a six course treatment, six week course. Uh, after one week, the downside is some people said, oh, the dog is a bit better, I'm gonna give up. No, don't do that. There's no downside to continuing for six weeks except your own schedule, what you can do. So reading about the difference this product makes is one thing, actually seeing it is another. So here's Elliot, a three and a half year old beagle. Beagles howl, this guy's howling but this guy's howling more than a beagle you might think would typically howl. This is all before the calmer canine. These Kong toys strewn all over the place here have treats inside the dog. A beagle, a beagle isn't interested in treats. Um, and you could see here the dog is expressing anxiety, literally tearing up the bay. So this is all before. And there's more of this, more of this, and more of this, and more of this, and more of this. I want to get to the after part. Okay, so a month later, one month, not necessarily six weeks. A month is four weeks, right? So even before the typical six-week course, after four weeks, this beagle's just hanging out, howling a little bit, as we'll see, but very, very little, um, no destructive behavior is busy doing what beagles do and is trying to get the treat out of the toy. So the howling of 15% of the time after compared to 71% before, the dog was actually able to rest or sleep when the people were away after the treatment. So this dog's Elliot. Uh, let's get to Elliot. There we go. Oh, that's who we just saw, sorry. Sorry, this is Cooper. Cooper's a beautiful dog. If the video starts, Cooper is being hyper vigilant, uh, watching, okay, where did people go? Barking a bit, watching, 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 not destroying anything, but clearly is distressed. One month later, not six weeks later, one month later, we see this. And, uh, Cooper, when Cooper lays down, notice how he lays down. There we go. Relaxed. You could tell by the way a dog lays down. That could be a whole talk in itself. Dogs are sending us signals all the time. And this dog is saying, I could not be more at ease, which is so nice to see. So this dog isn't only laying down. This dog is so comfortable. Uh, the number of watching exits goes down dramatically. The whining literally disappears. And the barking literally disappears. If there were to be neighbors involved, this is a house, but if there were to be neighbors involved because it's a condo or apartment, that barking makes a difference. So there's some practical issues here. Uh, first line in new cases, absolutely the calmer canine can be used, uh, but maybe lower doses of drugs as well because you're doing a combination of both those things. And who doesn't want lower doses of pharmaceuticals? Also, you may be able to get your dog off the pharmaceuticals sooner. It could be a jumpstart to improvement in stalled cases. For some reason, it's not the right pharmaceuticals or they're not working. Multimodal therapy is always a good idea, particularly, again, I hate to use this term, but in so-called severe cases. Uh, and older dogs with a lower tolerance or who cannot take a pharmaceutical or other dogs, and frankly, some of you will still say, no matter what I say, I'm not giving my dog drugs. 
given the right drug. Listen, if, if the dog is a little more tired, which doesn't happen with calm or canine, but with drugs, it can be, depending on the drug, that the dog is a little more tired, not stoned, not acting totally out of it, personality not changing, then it's totally the wrong drug for the wrong and the wrong dosage and everything. That should never happen. But a little bit tired compared to panicked, am I going to take a little nap or be panicked? Well, you know, uh, it's clear which is better for the dog. So behavior modification. We want to encourage independence. We want to uh, eradicate cues that we're going. So along with that, we want uh, graduated departures, as they're called. Is that the next slide? It is. So graduated departures is this. You're eradicating cues at the same time. So you're getting ready to leave the house. You are going to act like the best actor and get an Academy Award because you're act like you're you're going to act like you're leaving. You're going to do everything as if you're leaving the house. You've got somewhere to go. You're going to grab whatever you typically grab and head for the door and go nowhere, except back to the kitchen to continue cooking, or back to the sofa to continue streaming whatever you're watching on Netflix. And then you're going to do it again and again. And eventually you're going to go out that door and you're going to go for 20 seconds. Then you're going to go for a minute. If you see on that camera that the dog is acting distressed, even after a minute, you've gone too far too fast. However, if everything is okay, you're going to ramp it up to two minutes, ramp it up more to three minutes. If that's too much, you go back to a minute then make it five minutes, then go back to three minutes, then go up to six minutes, then take it back to five minutes. You're going to do, and there's no, there's no uh, right or wrong. There's no, there's no, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? There, there is absolute, there's, there's no protocol for this. Uh, that'll do. There's no protocol for this. So you work up to 10 minutes, then six minutes, then 12 minutes, then 15 minutes, then back down to 10. There's whatever those numbers are can be random, but the idea is you're going for longer, longer periods of time. But between that, you're taking it back to what you absolutely know your dog can handle. And then you're taking it up to, oh, I think my dog can handle that, but I'm not sure. If it was too much, you went too far, too much, too fast. And the problem with this is you can do it over a three day weekend, ideally, if not over a weekend, but then you got to go back to work. Everyone has to leave the house on Monday. So you have a pet sitter come in if you can, have a relative come in if you can, bring the dog to someone's house while you're, can, I mean, that's ideal. Someone's house who the dog knows and you know, obviously. Maybe even boarding the dog for a week or two weeks or three weeks until you can get this down better if you don't have time to do it, except on a weekend and maybe a couple of weeknights. Because then what you're doing is you're de leaving your dog home alone for, okay, you worked up to five minutes, but now you're leaving for eight hours. You'd never need to bring it to eight hours. There's no magic solution. But for most dogs, most of the time, once you hit an hour, you're okay. There are exceptions to that. And that is the dogs who have other anxieties to say noises. And they hear a noise and boy, then they get, to, then they get cued and, and you've got a problem. And I've got a solution to that. But that's the problem with graduated departures. But they are helpful to do what you can do. Exercise I talked about earlier is of, in of itself not a solution. But with these other things on board and going on, it's helpful. And also providing an enriched environment. So important to give your dog things to do in the house when you are not there. Um, practical issues here. Uh, oh, I went the wrong way on the slide. So I just described the graduated departures and what they are. So the problem is that, all right, those are good things. It's a lot, but are there other things we can do? I said multimodal earlier, I used that term, doing several things. And one of those things can be also providing something else. Now, what that something else is or how many something else's you provide depend on economics and also what your veterinarian thinks is right. Uh, calming care is a Purina 
pro plan veterinary care supplement. We know uh, that, and it makes sense actually, that a nutritional supplement that's a probiotic can impact lowering anxiety. If you think about it, before you took a big test, you might've gotten nervous and it might've gone to your stomach, right? That happens in humans, it happens in dogs. There is a connection there. So having a probiotic can help. Is that going to in of itself solve separation anxiety? No, it's an adjunct. I talked about what the two big heavy hitters are. A nutraceutical can be huge. So zilkine, there are so many out there, too many for me to talk about. So I will only talk about two that have science behind them. One is zilkine. It's a uh, bovine sourced hydrolyzed milk protein. It's like great, great, great grandma once said, uh, if you're worried, have a glass of warm milk. It'll calm you down. Same general idea there. Anxetane is L-theanine. It's found in green tea uh, naturally. Uh, and the tablets are palatable. And again, this can lower anxiety. I don't know that you need both of those. What you decide to do here is greatly a conversation you have with your veterinarian or perhaps a dog training professional. Thundershirt, you've heard of those, right? It's a wrap around, anxiety wrap, storm defender, same thing, same idea. Um, it wraps around your dog. It's like swaddling your dog of sorts. And for many, but not all dogs, it can help to comfort them. Uh, Thunder Ease is simply a thunder shirt with a daptyl. A daptyl is a pheromone that lowers anxiety levels. So what do you do about the other noises for dogs that are noise sensitive? The ceiling fan can help, or maybe cause this to happen, which is not what you want, but providing something in the background, because as I said, a lot of these dogs are doing fine, they're doing fine, they're doing fine, but they're anxious about noise in general. And then something happens, a garbage truck comes through, or maybe even airplanes flying over, whatever it might be. I said that because there's one flying over right now, but whatever it might be. So having music on in the background can help. And we know that music can actually lower anxiety in dogs. Uh, having a talk radio station on, having the TV on, and as I said, a ceiling fan. This is what people ask me about all the time and I don't freaking know. There has been no study, no study, no study yet about CBD and anxiety in dogs. I hope there is one tomorrow, uh, but not all CBD products are the same. That's one important message. Another is it might help. I mean, anecdotally, so many people have told me and you may have heard yourself that it helps. So it's something to ask your veterinarian about and your veterinarian will say, here's a CBD product I trust because some of them coming generally from other countries have things in them like arsenic that we really don't want our dogs taking even if it's a trace amount or you don't know anything about that product, then don't trust that product. Overall, CBD, can it be a good idea? We're gonna learn more, stay tuned. The answer could be yes, but we just don't know yet. Don't these dogs look like little angels almost? So. This is how to find me. This is where I am. I hope you do find me in social media. And I promised I would be done in a quarter two. It is now exactly, according to this, a quarter two. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have a dog with separation.